Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Cinema Wave podcast. We're here at the Culture Wave Media Network talking to you guys about one of the films that we got to check out at the Montclair Film Festival. This is a little film called Small Things Like These. It stars Killian Murphy, last year's Oscar winner for Oppenheimer. I'm going to be one of your hosts. My name is Darren Scalamoni. I am joined this time by Zach Miller. How's it going? How's it going? And this movie was a really special one that we got to check out at Montclair. I believe it was the second night that uh, we were there. And um, Tim Melance, who is the director of this film, was there. He gave a uh, a brief Q and A after we saw the film. Zach actually got to ask a question, um, and I just want to start by asking Zach pretty much like broad thoughts about what were your overall thoughts of this movie, whether it was coming in or after you saw the film, and then just sort of the reception that Tim got and uh, how great it was to sort of get some real insight into what it was to make this movie. Yeah, I, I think. Um... So Killian's coming off of Oppenheimer and that movie was a lot of spectacle and it was basically like a modern epic. This is like exactly the opposite of it, I would say. So because Killian is such a good actor, he can play both ways of the spectrum of the explosive Tommy Shelby. But in this movie, he can play the passive, um, complacent, very subtle um ben bill furlong who's a coal miner in this piece so i feel like if you're you can't go into this movie expecting fireworks you have to go into it understanding that this is told from his perspective it's very observational it is necessary that you are studying the film rather than sitting back and enjoying what's going to happen. You're kind of like keeping your ears perked up for like little clues and little breadcrumbs of what is going on because it's, it's told from his perspective, observing this uh, school in this local town where girls are sent to be uh, disciplined and rehabilitated in that way. So he's observing abuse in between the lines uh, throughout the movie and um, what Tim was talking about, too, in his Q&A was that it is from his perspective. And he thought it was so interesting that Claire Keegan's book that it's based on is told from a male perspective when it's observing female abuse mm-hmm. and that sense of like, should I step into this situation or should I not? So you have to go into this film anticipating that you won't get everything solved and you're not going to be fed answers. You're going to have to like perk your ears up a little bit, look at clues and then just really try and sympathize with what he's doing. He's, he's going to step into situations, but when is he going to do it? You know, or what, and how is that going to look like? And what is the effect of that going to look like? So it's a slow burn, I think. Definitely, definitely a slow burn, but not in the sense of, necessarily like Oppenheimer was another film like there was a lot more energy to it but some people were like it's a long movie a little bit of a slow burn in between this movie actually has a really quick runtime 96 minutes Mm -hmm. the book that it's based on that you brought up that's written by uh Claire Keegan by the same name small things like these um is I think like only 140 pages or something like that so it's a quick book and they're able to get a lot of story within this 96 minute runtime, which is why I think it's such a great watch for everybody this year. It's like one of those movies that I really genuinely hope like one of those smaller movies every year. There's like some of these um, smaller dramas that get picked up. I believe this is a focus features film um, where so many of these projects, they finally get distributors and they're trying to go for awards and things like that. But this is one of those movies that I definitely think everybody should check out, especially because of the runtime. It doesn't take up too much of your day, but it's a story that is really brilliantly told here by Tim and an incredible performance by Killian, which you brought up. It's so different than what he's done previously, but it can show just how great he is at the quiet moving sort of element of what the story is that there's a local convent run by, um, the, uh, mother St. Mary who, uh, or senior Mary, I should say, who's played by Emily Watson, who is quietly terrifying in, oh, in yeah. this role. And there's a scene that we could talk about later when we start to get into some of the spoilers of the film. Um, that's just, it's, it's one of my favorite scenes of the year between, between her and Killian and it's a real acting showcase for Killian, um, but also a real 
sort of opening into the life of Bill Furlong in general, because we get these flashbacks of him as a child that really sort of support all of the ideas of who he is as a person and why he's so devoted to this cause um, of these secrets that are being held by this comment that he feels that he needs to be the one to fully unravel and uncover all these things that a lot of people in the town are obviously mm -hmm. ignoring. And he has conversations with townspeople about it mm -hmm. and things like that. It's just, I think it's a really brilliant movie and it's, it's incredibly well-made. And Tim, I think did a great job with taking that interpretation of a very serious female issue from a male perspective and still not having it be something that feels not authentic because I think yeah. Killian's uh, interpretation of the text and just the way he, he acts. So I think you already brought this up, but how much he acts with his face in this movie mm. is, is it's incredible. Like I, I think, yeah. I, I hope he gets nominated for this. I don't know if he will. I don't know if it's as showy as a performance as something like an Oppenheimer. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I think he's great in the movie. And I think the movie is, is what, one of my favorites that we saw at the festival. Yeah. And, and like what Tim is able to do, by manipulating what is shown and what is not shown only makes you more interested. There were several instances in the movie where I was um, on the edge of my seat, not because it was necessarily tense, but because I was like leaning forward. I was like, wow, what did they say? Or what is he about to see? Like there were, there were some brilliant points where the editing choices to hold on how Killian is processing what he's imagining and what he's observing. He's like, what? There's some. There's something here. Like, there's there's something wrong. Like, what is going on in this situation? And am I actually seeing this? Like, that was his process. You could feel that just by how Killian subtly gives that in his performance, as well as the editing, which was great. Because then you're like, oh, cut to the next shot. Cut to the next shot. I want to see what he's looking at. Like, what is he looking at? Is somebody bloody in the ground? Is somebody, um, you know, like not clothed is somebody is somebody bruised like what's going on like we hear there's abuse but what does it look like so we're waiting for that and it keeps you really engaged the whole film so i loved the choices to manipulate that with the other technical aspects of the film there's also a lot of uh shadowy subtext to it um it's very like cloak and dagger without the murder aspect it's mm -hmm. like lots of scheming is going on bill is just an average coal miner and he's like what is my role in all of this is this really something that i should be getting involved in i'm just an average house mid mid, mid uh middle class guy who's mm -hmm. just trying to get by like is this really something that i should get involved in so it's like it really puts that up to the viewer as well of you know it puts that in their chair of like, what would you do in this situation? It's a very like self-reflective piece of like, because this is <clears throat> told from the male perspective, he's not involved with the abuse, but what would you do in that situation? It poses that kind of feeling. And then I was also going to say too, um, kind of a similar film that deals with similar subject matters is Spotlight. And Spotlight is about the team of journalists who are trying to uncover the Catholic Church abuse in Boston. And I actually feel like that film, even though the subject matter is um, the same, it feels like the antithesis to the creation of this one because mm -hmm. that one is very active. It's very much so the journalists going after these people. What's the new angle that we can get in? Who can we interview? What, what are we going to do to stop this? Like, and it's very... Um, cla it's more classically structured of a narrative than this one. This one is solely passive. It's very complacent. You're waiting for him to discover just one bombshell instead of <clears throat> several that will build a case. There's no building a case like a mm -hmm. crime movie, mm -hmm. although it has crime elements. So I think it's like, I don't know if this movie will be for everyone necessarily because it is that slow character study it's very much so a process piece and focusing on like an analysis than a structured narrative yeah you know? it's a very personal story to bill while still uncovering and yeah. like you said pulling back the cloak of what is happening within ireland at this time right and i think so like you brought up spotlight like a lot of those journalistic 
films and spotlight again the the um the sort of context of what is happening in that movie is similar to this but like i think a spotlight and it's like you think of like all the president's men and the post and it's like mm. they have a very frantic and frenetic pace to them because like yeah. you said it's trying to uncover this crime and we have to get the word out to these people in this and what killian's character bill does in this um like you were talking about in this story is so much of like he feels like he can't even talk to anybody about what's going on because everybody is just sort of passively being like well you know you're gonna have to learn to deal with some things that happen mm -hmm. in the world because yeah. there's gonna be blowback on us if there's not there's a scene specifically with his wife that happens where um it sort of is the aftermath of uncovering this girl for the first time right and uh what the main girl that he eventually goes on to try to help in his own way that's a member of this convent who is who is being abused and he has a conversation with his wife and his wife literally says like you have to look you have to look the other way like mm -hmm. like we can't have this sort of impact our family like we have daughters that are going to have to go to school and these people have a lot of power in this town and we can't allow that to happen and it happens in such a way that it's not like you said it's not one of those pieces where like i think about in spotlight the scene where mark ruffalo's character like yells at the top of his oh, lungs yeah. and it's like yeah. it's just like, like oscar clip keep getting and, away with this. yes yeah 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 and this movie is so much more quiet but yes. in the same way moving um in such a way because of the realities of what this deals with mm -hmm. um and i'm curious on your thoughts because so much of that is the driving force of the story obviously but we get these asides um of bill as a child and um losing his mother and uh this woman mrs wilson and the impact that she had as well as um i guess it's the i think it's the mother's boyfriend i don't think it's his father um mm, that yeah. uh that sort of they take him in they take him on once his mother passes away in the flashback and you start to see i'm curious like so for me in my interpretation of the film i thought it was so needed in terms of the development of who he is as a person and as a guy right not having been given the easiest life and trying to sort of give back in some sort of way and always feeling like he needs to be the protector because he was unable to protect his mother at a young age when she passed away right and i think mm. there's another scene that happens early on in the film which i love that it's in the movie but again like you said i don't know if it will resonate the same way with every viewer but he's driving back with Cole in his truck and this young boy passes him on the road and he's kind of uh he's kind of running away from home is what it's implying essentially and uh killian's like oh like how you doing like he mm -hmm. gets out of his car and it's a young boy and he's like how you doing like uh tell your parents i said happy christmas and he gives him money and the right. kid doesn't ask him for money but killian has this feeling you, you like bill has this feeling as a character that he needs to protect this kid. He needs to do something. Yeah. He needs to do something. He feels yeah. compelled that he has to do something. Right. And when he gets home and he mentions it to his wife, the same sort of thing happens where she's like, why would you do something like that? Why would you give him money? Yeah. Yeah. I love those little plants. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's such a, such a testament to what the script does um, and what Tim's able to do with his direction mm -hmm. and killing him as a performer that they can craft this overall narrative about bill as a, in a character study still dealing um with the backdrop of what's happening with the magdalene sisters in this convent right. so i'm just curious on the personal aspect of it for you and how that interweaves yeah. how did you feel about the way they crafted the narrative yeah and just like kind of what the, the uh i mean tim was even saying in the q a was that because it was based through bill's perspective and i'm not sure how much of the flashbacks are in the book but he was specifically saying it's like <clears throat> Bill dealing with his grief and how everything he witnesses is he's he has a harder time reacting to it, especially like being a kid. He probably felt like he could have done more to help his mom. He, and like everyone, you know, a kid in that situation is like, what could I have done? Even if it was like a health issue or something like a kid wants to be there and do something, you know, they don't know the full scale of the situation. but. So he, I think, was kind of looking at, you know, I, I'm getting now given the chance where I can do something for somebody. 
<clears throat> and he's very reluctant to do that many times in the beginning and just about halfway through. So it's really like him overcoming that fear of his own, like he's getting in his own way, you know, like, and I, I think that's very much what the story is intended to be of like calling to action that if we see something as profound and like traumatic as that, or if we get a hint that there is an abuse, it's worth looking into, you know, even if it's not what it appears to be, it's worth saying something, being a good Samaritan and doing something about it. Um, I think a lot of his childhood moments, the flashbacks were built on his grief and like how he was just trying to process like the, the sudden loss of his mother, um, building a life for his family too. Like he wanted to give his kids everything he could for Christmas. He wanted to provide for them. Everything is sweet at home. That's another thing. Like his wife is very much like, don't say anything. Everything's all good. Um, Sister Mary is like basically bribing them in a way as like hush money. There's nothing officially said directly, but it's kind of like, oh, here's something for Christmas after he discovers several details. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, do I take this money and do I actually take a bribe? And act, and then in that moment, he's like, if she's giving me money, this is out of the ordinary. She wouldn't have just done that out of the compassion of her heart, which she probably could have done as a nun, too. So it's a lot of, you know, building towards when is this guy going to step in based off of his surroundings and that kind of thing. Um, and then definitely like the vulnerability of young people, too. Like it's it's very much like the impressions of loss or abuse on younger people and what they are built into. Fortunately, it looks like Bill went a positive route and he grew up to be a decent man living a decent job. But I think he also knows that those girls in that situation, if they're already going to the school to get like rehabilitated and disciplined for the better of society, like, and they're getting violated, that's not something that he can sit idly by for. And I think that's like very compelling. So this film is like saying a lot without saying much. It's, it's very visual. It's a yeah. perfect example of like show don't tell filmmaking. Yeah. And I think that what I love about it too is that it showcases the potential impact of someone acting through bravery and what they could potentially lose Mm -hmm. with being brave yeah. like seeing like you said the antithesis of what his wife is talking about and just like taking in the title which again is the title of, of the book which neither of us have read but i, I want to go back and read it now because i'm actually super curious mm. but i think i think it's a very um honorable adaptation based on what i've read but <clears throat> so much of it is like even in the title of this film like small things like these to so many people yeah. In the town, they're willing to swallow these small things that are not small things. It's this, it's this abuse that was so intrinsic and systemic within the Magdalene society for decades mm -hmm. in Ireland. And mm -hmm. um, there, there's so much there with, with when we finally get that interaction between Bill and um, the young girl, Sarah, who uh, I think she's played by Zara Devlin, doesn't even have a photo on IMDb. And she's tremendous in this movie yeah in the little bit that she's in so people should take notice of zara devlin because she's great in this film yeah but um she's this young woman who's who's a member of the magdalen laundry um which again is this institution that is essentially run by the uh catholic nuns in ireland and bill just discovers one day when delivering coal that she's hiding out um and uh she's pregnant and mm. she needs she needs someone to save her and Bill at first sort of is like, I want to help you, but this is not my flag to bear. You know, right. like this is not, this is not my business. I came across you. I want to help you and I will take you back to the laundry and we will, we will, I will, I will make you feel protected in that way. Mm -hmm. And what happens after that in the scene that you were talking about with sister Mary played by Emily Watson it's just such great acting. Mm -hmm. It's such a tremendous scene. It reminds me of um, 
it reminds like Emily Watson, even in like, she, she's only in, I think about two or three scenes mm. throughout the film, but she's another one that like, I, I hope she gets a nomination for how good she is in this, yeah. in this one essential scene in the movie. And I'm not going to give a lot of it away because a lot of people haven't seen this. This movie comes out worldwide on November 8th. Mm -hmm. So people should definitely go out and see this movie that we had a chance to see early at Montclair Film Festival, which again, special shout out to them for welcoming us and giving us um, press right. access to this. But there's so much baked in that scene that is so telling about this world that, that, that these characters are living in and what Bill's mission is to sort of combat the small things that everybody else is sort of overlooking throughout yeah. all these things that are happening. And I just think it really is – it's such rich storytelling and it's, it, it's a movie that requires focus. There's really great – um below the line things that are happening between the sound mm. design yeah <clears throat> one of the things we haven't brought up yet which tim also talked about and there was a question asked at the q a was um the breathing that happens throughout oh you, yeah you hear bill breathing heavily throughout this film some people might find it annoying i hope you don't because to me i didn't even notice it that's how good it was it's yeah. it's so atmospheric and it just fits yeah. the way that this narrative is being told mm -hmm. that i just think it's brilliant and even uh they were talked about sort of the sound design in terms of walking along the cobblestone in the quiet nights and what what that means and and mm. just how quiet this world is i guess and bill has so much noise in his head that we don't hear we just hear it through the breathing yeah. and him trying to get through it's just i just think it's i think it's a remarkable movie i really mm -hmm. do it's it's absolutely one of my favorites of the year so yeah. far i was gonna add to one more thing off of uh emily watson i was trying to pinpoint it the whole movie and then after the fact i remembered i kind of got like very nurse ratchet vibes from one floor over the cuckoo's nest and where she's just completely comfortable in her authority and how she's manipulating that authority. And she's just like completely standoffish to him. Like, what are you talking about? Like, this is a normal thing here. Like, I'm not going to tell you exactly what you're thinking, but I'm on to you. You know, like, like that moment where she's by the fireplace, I don't want to give too much away, but you can hear a pin drop basically because they both understand that they are aware she's aware that he knows and he's like how am i gonna get out of the situation without tipping her off yeah. you know but he he slowly figures out oh she's on to me so then um yeah i was just very enraptured by like her performance and just just like the fact that she could take over a, a scene and just dominate like those moments made Killian feel so small in those moments too was another testament to the directing um on Tim because also because of what little we see of her you really feel her villainous behavior like we don't need to see everything that happens you can kind of fill in your own imagination of what she's doing to these women mm -hmm. and the other sisters there they're being complicit in the acts of whatever is happening so we get alluding two situations and um tim uses that for like all of the abuse in the magdalene church too at the, at the very end they they talk about how uh but a, a x amount of victims were affected by you know this type of abuse in the magdalene church society so mm -hmm. it's it's good that you don't have to know the details to know that people were affected in different ways it just focuses on this particular story um but yeah why don't you also tell us about the story of how this movie was made i was actually just yeah. gonna bring that up so again so this is a smaller movie i don't know the budget offhand but it has to be if, if it's not in the single digits it's, i'll look up for it i would yeah. say i think the highest budget this movie could have been was maybe like 20 million if it's more than that i'd be shocked um but basically <clears throat> tim Melance, who is the director of this one we brought up multiple times does such a great job with this movie he met Killian uh, on Peaky Blinder season three. He directed all of season three of Peaky and uh, they really loved working with one another. They wanted to work on something else together. And while they were working on set, Killian's wife actually suggested maybe they work on this novel that she was reading called Small Things Like These. Um, both of them didn't expect after reading the book that the rights would even be available to Claire Keegan's novel. But um, after they called Keegan's agent, they said it is available. 
Killian acquired the rights and then with his producing partner pitched the idea on set of Oppenheimer to his co-star in Oppenheimer, Matt Damon, who he worked so closely with. And Matt Damon uh, was setting up a studio with Ben Affleck. We've talked about it on here before. Artists Equity, they did air last year. They have another film coming out soon um, called Unbreakable, another film that actually played at Montclair, which we unfortunately didn't have a chance to see. But um, Matt Damon loved the story, and the two between him and Affleck sort of came together and said, we will fund the movie for you guys. And Tim actually talked about it on the Q&A at Montclair and saying, like, you know, trying to raise money for these smaller stories, these character studies – is not always the easiest thing, but this was one of the easiest situations where we were able to just sort of get the money from Matt and Ben, which is, which is so awesome that this story gets to be told. And I think it's, it's really remarkable and it's a testament to, again, the community of, of, of filmmaking too, right? Like if, if Killian and Matt yeah. Damon aren't on set of Oppenheimer, this movie never gets made. Um, mm. And I think that's really poetic in the, in the way that it goes. And Tim, uh, after having seen this film, I went back into his IMDb. I mean, Peaky is great, obviously, and season three is terrific. He also worked on the final four episodes. I don't know if you've ever watched Zach, but uh, it was it's an AMC uh, horror anthology series, The Terror. I have seen a little bit. And he did the last yeah. four episodes of season one, which is, I think it's one of the most underrated shows we got in like the peak TV cool. era. Like nobody really talked about it. Yeah, yeah. He also worked on Legion, which was on FX and starred Dan Stevens. So he has a lot of experience as a TV director mm. um, and has done some feature films, but this is probably going to be his big sort of coming out for at least hopefully American audiences when this film does go wide on the 8th. And then Enda Walsh wrote this uh, film. She adapted the script. Um, she previously wrote Hunger which was one of Steve McQueen's early on works. It might've been his debut film um, as mm -hmm. well as the house, which is a stop motion film on Netflix. So those are some of the other works that the creative team has done. Mm -hmm. But the story of how the movie came together is, is, is really great. Honestly, yeah. I think it's really cool how just, you know, uh, well, not a simple connection because they're both massive stars, but yeah. Matt Damon and Killian for them to bond on set. And then to just say, Hey, I have this idea and this thing like that is what you're saying as well um what we need more of in the industry too i think we need to be investing in these stories especially like something that is so profound and important to tell anyways but for indie film as a general whole um you know a lot of big studios are not gonna really find these things and then package it necessarily it's good that they kind of went the opposite route of packaging something killian had the project he's like i want to do it Let's get other people involved. So um, I, I think that's another good route that indie film can keep their life going. You know, like we need those lower budget movies to keep being made. Focus features is great. Um, I will. I was you know, I was mistaken yeah. on focus features. I it do wasn't. Wanna, it wasn't. So okay. it's actually Ari's Equity produced the film as well as Big Things Films. And then it actually Lionsgate acquired it, which okay. is a bigger, which okay. is a bigger studio. We do love obviously what focus yes. features does too, but Again, having um, artist equity sort of be the ones to shepherd this project and get it moving along and then having it be seen by a company like Lionsgate is still awesome to, to get this thing sort of going. Did you get anything on the um, – I didn't. On no. the budget? Yeah, I can't even I, find the budget for this film. But again, it can't be too high of a budget. Um, I think you could potentially get it with your IMDb Pro. But I was also going to say something about Lionsgate um, now that we're on the topic is you know they, this is not going to make them like killer money you know like this is not that type of movie to do that anyways but it's a you know they're in a, a bit of a pit themselves with Lionsgate and Megalopolis uh never let go um the ballerina movie which might do well for John Wick um Borderlands like they've they need some other new success at least for this year so i think this is definitely like one of the strongest films that they have this year and i think it's definitely important that people see it in general um but yeah it's i like seeing Lionsgate have such a spread of a catalog too yeah because they don't make one type of movie they're they're pretty decent distributor from what we can see of the types of projects that they invest in. They definitely try to do a little bit of everything. Um, there's even like some Christmas movies. Oh, the crow, 
Yep, the crow was also yeah. So they have some IP hard. stuff. I mean, John Wick, I don't even think wasn't yeah. initially intended to be a major franchise, and then you get Ballerina <clears throat> coming yeah. out um, next year with Ana de Armas and sort of wrapping yeah. up all that stuff and bringing it together. And then they've done like you know Academy Award nominated films like <clears throat> The Fablemans, 1917, Green Book, Molly's Game, Crash, like. But they also with those films too, uh, even with these films, they pick directors with strong visions um and then they have like other things that play to uh audiences you know like they have christmas movies they have action movies they have other stuff so they're they're really trying to spread the cast a wide net yeah you know? for so, sure but. well we've discussed this movie at length it's time for scores now again the film is not out wide yet um it will come out wide um distributed by lionsgate um, on November 8th, we highly recommend, even before we give scores, I think we could both highly recommend this movie to you guys. It's one that you guys should definitely see. Like I said, it's, it's barely over 90 minutes. So it's one that you can <clears throat> go with people of all ages. It'll probably hit for uh, obviously a, an older crowd. Um, but if you're just a fan of movies in general, I think you'd be a really big fan of, of what this film is trying to do, um, with great performances. And again, terrific direction by Tim Lance. And again, just to thank you again to Montclair Film Festival for letting us get to cover this. Um, as I said throughout the review, this is definitely one of my favorite films of the year thus far. Um, it's one that I, I, it inspires me for a lot of different reasons. I'm excited to see what Killian has to do next coming off of something like this. I'm excited to see what Tim is going to do next uh, coming off of something like this. And it's just a really, really well-made piece of filmmaking and uh i really enjoyed this film i'm going to go with a 9.5 for Ooh, small wow. things like that's these. a great score yeah i really 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 enjoyed this film <clears throat> very very much at the that's film that's really cool so yeah. zach what about you yeah i'm also gonna give it like a nine um i kind of just do like a rounded out mm -hmm. version but um yeah this is like really a must watch for the year, especially because um, it's been a little light this year with like really solid movies. Mm -hmm. I think they're all coming around in this last fall and winter before award season. I also have this like number five of like everything I've seen this year so far. So I, I like, might this have this higher there. than number five. You probably will. Yeah, yeah. I think I do, which I is cool. I do. And I, I'm excited to talk about our list too later on. Yes, yeah. I am too. Now th this is the best time of the year for us because we get to the awards movies, the ones that kind of hit a little bit deeper and we are still fit. We're big fans of temple movies. Like Zach and I are big Marvel fans. Unfortunately, the Marvel movies haven't been hitting as much in recent memory. Hopefully things start to start trending in the right direction, but this is a great movie. Like I said, a smaller film that everybody should check out and support at the theaters at your local cinemas. But those are our scores. Let us know in the comments. Um, if you guys, a lot of you guys probably haven't seen this film by the time this review comes out, but are you anticipating it? Are you guys excited based on what we told you? Um, if you did have a chance to see this at any of the festivals, it premiered at Berlin a few months ago. Uh, if you were a, at Montclair Film Festival, definitely let us know and let us know what your thoughts on this film were in general. I know we got a lot of Killian fans, obviously, too, who I'm sure are excited to see this first project he's doing post Oppenheimer. Um, if you guys can also give this video a like and subscribe to us, we are the Culture Wave Media Network. Um, we're very close. We're trying, we're on the road to 500 subscribers. Once we reach 500 subscribers, we can start monetizing, which is great news because we can start doing more stuff for you guys, including watch alongs and more reviews and, and things in, in all the realms of things that we want to do here at culture wave. So please, if you guys can subscribe and share with your friends, that would be great. Also, we're on all social media. You guys can follow it. It's under me right here in the video, as well as in the description, you guys can find out all that information there and check out all the other stuff we have for you guys as well. Just signing off, I am Darian Scalamoni. I'm Zach Miller. And we will see you guys next time. This is The Culture.